<laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, we all know what a pharmacist does. They fill those brown bottles with the right number of pills and the right dosage that your doctor ordered. Hopefully. <laughs> but I can tell you what, there's a special group of pharmacists who do, well, they do a lot more than that. They provide oversight and direction for the use of investigational medications in research studies at the Mayo Clinic. They promote patient safety. They make sure that we're compliant with all the rules and regulations that go along with research studies, of which there are many. And they make sure that the, drug pati- the drugs that patients are getting are safe. Joining us in studio to talk more about the role of research pharmacists at the Mayo Clinic are Dr. Anna Bartu and Dr. Heidi Finnis. Welcome both of you to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Bartu, Dr. Finnis. So you're both physicians, a PhD, so that means like you're really smart pharmacists. <laughs> <laughs> you do more than just dispense drugs. That's correct. So we both have the Doctor of Pharmacy degree. We're not physicians. Um, and we get to support over a thousand clinical trials at Mayo Clinic, which is really exciting. Oftentimes patients find themselves in a situation where they have a disease where there is no drug currently available that can treat it. And by coming to Mayo and participating in a trial, that gives them the opportunity to perhaps find something that will work to treat their disease. So tell us about the trials. Does it necessarily mean that they're getting the drug, everybody who's in that trial, or are some patients getting the drug and some not? Well, this is Heidi. It depends, actually, on the type of trial that that patients are in. I know many patients, we have conversations with them about whether or not they're getting the placebo. Um, Many trials are trials of giving the investigational drug Um, to try it out for a new disease and then only when it goes to a phase three or later clinical trial where there's lots of patients being enrolled may they be um, trialed on a standard of care um, that would traditionally treat for for example their type of cancer or um, potentially a placebo if there's nothing else that's offered at that point and a placebo is a sugar pill it's the dummy drug this. Sometimes, but if, <laughs> if given IV, a placebo can look very differently in a, an IV bag and administered via vein in the same manner in which um, an IV investigational medication is given. But it doesn't have the drug in it. Correct. Dr. Finnis, do you figure out the randomization or is that something that the researcher does? So oftentimes there's a randomization schedule that is set up by the statistics associated with, um, with the study itself. Sometimes if that study is an internal Mayo Clinic written study, then we get that from our statistics department. Other times it's assigned via the sponsor of the study, whether that be the government, whether that be a pharmaceutical company. And that information can come to us in a variety of ways, most often of which is an interactive response system. Um, And so in those, we can log into a system or call a certain phone number, get the randomization for that patient, and then prepare the correct um, drug for the patient. So tell us exactly what that means, randomization. Who gets the drug and who doesn't? Correct. So specific studies will have a schema of how many patients are to receive the investigational drug versus how many patients will receive the standard of care. So say it's a new trial trialing a cancer treatment for colorectal cancer against um the first line standard of care, full FOX um, chemotherapy. And so in that instance, maybe two patients are randomized to the investigational treatment versus one to the, the standard of care treatment. And so in that mechanism, based on however that's set up behind the scenes, those systems, usually a computer sets that up, Um, then will tell us exactly which treatment the patient's supposed to receive. Dr. Bartu, this sounds like a lot of record keeping, a lot of organization. Are you a really organized type of a personality? So I think that's one thing you can universally say about pharmacists is we're very detail oriented and meticulous. And it's very important that their records are accurate because when these medicines are evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, everything has to be in order so that they have the information they need to be able to evaluate the drug to make sure that it's safe and effective and isn't going to cause harm to patients. But if it's something that, if it's a drug that has not been FDA approved, where does it come from? Do you get it right from the manufacturer? That's a great question. So we actually have some novel agents that have been developed here at Mayo Clinic in different research labs. Um, Pharmaceutical companies are a very large sponsor of our trials and they provide the, um, the medicines. 
Let's talk about the cancer center because there are so many people these days getting chemotherapy, coming in and out every day, every couple of weeks. Uh, are you the ones who prepare those drugs for all those patients? Yes, depending on where the treatment is taking place, the research pharmacies are preparing the, the medications associated with the treatments for patients with cancer that are on an investigational trials. And, and so the ones that are given IV, they have to be sterile. So do you have a preparation room where you make sure that these are sterile before they're given to the patient? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of people don't understand all the things that are involved in preparing drugs that are going to be given in the vein. It's very important that the drugs are um, sterile, that they don't have bacteria or other organisms that can cause disease or harm the patient. So we have specialized clean rooms um, where these drugs are prepared. Our pharmacy technicians are very well trained in what we call aseptic technique. That's making sure that they don't introduce um, harmful things into the from their own skin or different contamination. And there's a lot of special um, protective clothing that is worn and a lot of care and attention taken to make sure that these medicines are exactly how they should be. Dr. Finnis, do you help figure out the protocol for these studies? Um, that's a whole other level of what you can do to assist in, the, in this study. So one of the things I think the research pharmacists um, really enjoy is the ability to participate, particularly when Mayo Clinic um, physicians um, author a clinical trial we help to write the drug templates associated with how the drug should be given and so that it's given in the same manner at many other institutions that may be also participating in the trial. We help to write um, the inclusion and exclusion criteria um, to be sure that patients aren't on concurrent medications that may cause drug-drug interactions associated with their treatments and help to be sure that supportive care um, say nausea and vomiting medications with chemotherapy, for example, um, are available to the patient and um, we support them as best we can throughout the clinical trial. So what is, how long is the shelf life for most of these drugs? For example, if you have 100 patients coming in for chemotherapy today, and I'm sure there are more than that, when can you prepare those drugs? Can you prepare everything the day before and have it available or some of the drugs you have to prepare just before the patient gets there? So that's a great question because oftentimes patients are wondering, what takes so long? Why am I waiting for my drug? Um, so to answer your question, there are many reasons um, why things can't be prepared in advance. The doses are tailored special for that patient. So oftentimes we need additional information before we can prepare the dose, such as the patient's weight, or we're mm. looking at lab work to make sure that um, the dose doesn't need to go higher or lower or may be held at all. Um, another thing is when we talk again about randomization, oftentimes for these studies that we call blinded, when neither the participant or the physician know what the patient's getting, it requires us to make sure that we select the specific medication containers for that patient designated through the system. Now, are you in constant communication with the physician who's caring for that patient and helping them? You, I think you did mention this, but there can be some drug interactions that the physician may not be aware of that could potentially happen based on the kind of drug that you're giving. I, I assume you help the physician determine that and Correct. So one prevent of the, adverse effects? One of the things that the research pharmacy groups do um, is we have a rubric that we apply to clinical trials, and it means it's a set of... Um, basically instances in which we should ask the uh, study team to have a pharmacy consult prior to the patient going on to a clinical trial if it's at high risk for drug-drug interactions. So our team, for example, will complete more than 500 of these pharmacist consultations on patients going on to clinical trials. About 15% of patients wouldn't be eligible, um, but because we conduct these pharmacy consultations, patients were able to recommend an alternative medication and they're able to go on to receive the clinical trials. Wow. Pretty cool. So, so do you ever uh, interact directly with the patient? Um, yes, sometimes we do um, when we have questions specific to certain drugs. One of the big things that we try to teach patients is um, anytime they start a new medication, say 
for a cold at home and they're starting an antibiotic or, or something like that, we have them call back to the study team so that we're constantly checking to be sure that nothing's going to interfere with that study medication that they're on. Um, so we do have contact with the patient sometimes um, face-to-face if they request it. Um, otherwise, it's a lot of communication um, either via the telephone or, or via their electronic medical records. I think being a pharmacist is a pretty good, a great gig. What is it that made each of you want to take this next step to be a research pharmacist? So when I completed my training, um, I got the opportunity to come to Mayo and they were expanding the research pharmacy at that time and it seemed like it would be a great way to advance my career in a unique area um, that was exciting, Um, novel drug therapies and a way to help patients that may have no other treatment otherwise. Um, Well, I'd been a cancer pharmacist um, for many years and I actually enjoyed learning the new treatments and seeing the results actually of what clinical trials can do for patients and advancing um, patient lives and for cancer at least seeing the start of the immunotherapy kind of to what it's doing for patients today that in and of itself is very rewarding and kind of the reason to come to work. Well, I think you are both an invaluable asset to the clinical practice at the Mayo Clinic. And now you know, Tracy, if you are part of a research study at the Mayo Clinic, there is someone watching out for you, making sure that you get the right drug at the right dose at the right time. Our thanks to research pharmacists, Dr. Anna Bartu and Dr. Heidi Finnis. Thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you. you.